Welcome to the Kanoi Church Podcast. We're glad that you're interested in connecting through this teaching time. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy this teaching from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. I am glad that you are with us and I am with you this morning. If this is your first time with us, we are in the middle of a series called Foundations where we're studying 1st and 2nd Timothy, which are books you can find in the Bibles that are on your chairs. Um, We're in week five, which means we are in chapter five of 1st Timothy. Now, we call them books of the Bible, but what these are are letters. The Apostle Paul wrote some letters and he wrote some letters to some pastors, specifically Timothy and Titus. We call those the pastoral letters. So we're in 1 Timothy, and what Paul's doing is giving Timothy guidance on what does it look like for us to be the church? What are the, what's the instructions that he has for us to live like a family? And so because he's giving us instructions as a community, it's important that we hear these things as a community. That does not mean that there aren't things that we should hear as individuals when we read these chapters, but it does mean that we need to specifically have our ears tuned to our community. So often we get so wrapped up in hearing, what is this supposed to say to me? And we get the idea that sermons are all about the pastors talking to you about your life and your life only. But the fact of the matter is we're a community of people. And so this letter is written to a community, and so we need to hear it as a community. One of the things that I wanna remind us, and this is gonna come out in our passage today, is to remember that these are instructions given to Timothy, the pastor of a church, in a place called Ephesus, by Paul. Paul knew the city of Ephesus well, and he gave them to Timothy 2,000 years ago. And I'm saying all that to remind you of the context. We are reading someone else's mail, essentially. Okay, so you've reached into the post office box, you've pulled out a letter addressed to a guy named Timothy, written from a guy named Paul, and you've opened it up and you're beginning to read it. The first thing we have to realize is what is the context of that letter? We, we have to understand the context of what Paul is writing Timothy before we can understand how is this letter gonna apply to my life, okay? So that's one of the reasons that we talk about context here. We wanna get the application piece right. Be very easy for us to read something that says, um, shake the dust off of your sandals, right? And we think, oh, in Bible times, they must have been really particular about having clean shoes, yeah? And, but it doesn't mean have clean shoes, it means leave, it means go away. In order for us to understand what it means, we have to understand the context of what it's being said in. I hope that makes some sense to you. Um, like the other weeks, what we're doing is having somebody read the scripture for us. So we have the privilege of having Bibles. And so you can open your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter five and read along with us. But in the first century, this letter would have been read to the community aloud, and so they would have just heard it read. And so I'm gonna invite you that if you aren't a person who needs to to follow along, just listen to what the letter has to say. So we'll read a couple verses, and we'll talk about it, read a couple more, talk about it, get through the chapter. So we'll start with verses one and two, if you would please. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Okay. I think rebuke is a really good church word. (laughs) And that's the place that we often hear the word rebuke, as in church, or we might read it in the Bible somewhere. But it isn't as common in our conversation. I can't think of the last time that I had a conversation with somebody where I talked about, (laughs) I used the word rebuke for any reason. Um, Words that we would use in our modern tongue when we're talking with people might be things like reprimand or criticize. That would be a good word here, ones that we're familiar with. Now, the NIV, which is what we have in the the chairs here, the NIV translation, does a really good job of putting it into a, a nice sentence for our modern ears. It says, do not rebuke an older man harshly. A bit more literally, it's um, don't sharply rebuke an older man. To emphasize the word rebuke, we have to understand this, uh, to understand the level of harshness, what they do is they just repeat a Greek word. So if you were gonna literally read it, it would say, do not rebuke rebuke. As a way to get the idea that the rebuke isn't bad, we don't wanna be 
overly rebuking, overly critical, overly harsh in our rebuke of somebody. Do not rebuke rebuke. All right? So who isn't Timothy supposed to rebuke rebuke? If you read the passage, he's not supposed to rebuke rebuke older men, younger men, older women, younger women. So who's left? No, there's no one left, right? You could say children, but really, that, no one's left. There's no one left to rebuke rebuke. This is a... This is a good instruction for all of us to understand, too, that Paul is saying, look, there's no place for you to be harsh in your rebuke. There's no place for you to be overly critical critical in your rebuke. Don't overdo it. Rebuking isn't a bad thing, but don't overdo it. Don't avoid it. Don't overdo it. Now, here's a side note. Sometimes you guys have to put up with things that I find interesting, but sometimes the things I find interesting might be helpful to you. In order to communicate older man, all right, when he says this in the passage, don't rebuke, rebuke an older man, what he does is he repeats a word again. He uses the rebuke, rebuke trick. And so what it literally says is do not rebuke, rebuke, elder, elder. Do not rebuke, rebuke, elder, elder. And so then we're like, well, what does that mean? Does that mean somebody who's super old, like a super elder, like a really, really old person in the church? And, and it doesn't mean that. Here's the interesting thing. When he says elder, elder, one elder means an older person, but the other elder is talking about a position. So how do you rebuke somebody who has a position of authority in the church, or somebody who has had a past position of authority, maybe like a retired pastor or somebody that used to serve on your elder board, how do you go about rebuking that person? In the same way, not overly critical, not with harshness. You do it carefully. You do it graciously and carefully. Now, here's the interesting thing. When it says not to do that to an older woman, it's the exact same thing. It's elder, elder, just the feminine version of it. So it's saying again, don't do this to an older woman, but don't do this to an older woman who's also been in leadership or is in leadership, okay? And I think that's really important for us to remember. Don't rebuke, rebuke. Don't be overly critical of anyone. There's no reason for that. Being overly critical doesn't win you anything. It doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't get your point across any more helpfully. Rebuke. Just let your words stand as is. Let's go ahead and read the next section. We're going to read verses 3 to 8. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions too, so that no one may be open to blame. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Okay, there's a lot there. I think it's, this is an, I didn't plan it this way. I wish I could say I did, but it's an appropriate chapter for Mother's Day. All right, because we're going to be talking about widows as a big chunk of this chapter. Um, There's really two things that we need to focus on or point out in this part of the passage. First, Paul says that the first line of care for a widow is her family. That's important for us to know. If a widow has children or grandchildren, they should be the first ones to step forward and care for the widow prior to bringing the widow's need to the church. Now, if the widow has no family, then who does she go to for help? It says that she goes to God for help. And how does God answer her call for help, her cry for help? He gives her the church family. So if the widow doesn't have immediate family or biological family or children or something to take care of her, the church family steps in and is that family for the widow. That is our call. That is our call, okay? I need you to understand that as a community of people who gather together, who call yourself followers of Jesus, who gather together under one roof every week, our call is to care for the widows, But I also need you to hear as an individual that if there is a widow in your family, you are the first line of defense. You are the first person that should be stepping up to help care for those needs. Now, does that mean that a widow with biological family or children doesn't have a church family? Of course not. I want to make that really clear. Okay, I'm not saying in any way, shape, or form that if a widow has children, then she doesn't have a church family. It's just that care first comes from the biological family before it comes from the church family. And there's a difference too, I have to make clear that there's a difference between being unable to help and being unwilling to help. 
So it's totally possible the widow has children, but they don't have the means to give her the assistance that she needs. That is different than children ignoring their mother who was a widow. It is different than refusing to meet that need. And in the case where we don't have the means to meet the need, yeah, we go to the church. That's what we're here for. That's why we gather together. And Paul is very harsh right here in his saying. He says, look, if you don't step up and take care of the widow that's in your family, then you deny the faith. You deny the faith you've been given. Which takes me to James chapter one. If you are familiar with James chapter one, you know this verse, verse 27. Religion that God our Father finds pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. If we don't step up and care for the widows, then we are denying the faith that has been handed to us from those who came before us, okay? Now the second thing that we have to look at in this passage is that Paul sort of makes, it seems like a strange delineation between a widow who is in need, who's actually in need, and one who's living for pleasure. I don't know if you noticed that. If you have your Bibles open, you look at it again. He's talking about two different kinds of widows here. The word that he's talking about is spatalao, and he says it three times. It's kind of like that rebuke, rebuke thing, right? He says it three times to give it lots of emphasis. Spatalao, spatalao, spatalao. Three times right in a row. And what it means is pleasure. Pleasure or luxury. So when he says it three times in a row, he's saying, look, there's, there are widows out there that are living in pleasure, 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 or luxury, luxury, luxury. They have so much, and they're just living in all of this luxury and all of this wealth. It's excessive riches, richness. And Paul is saying that the widow who lives in excessive luxury has no need to be helped by the church with food or money or housing or anything like that. Further, Paul says that the widow with excessive luxury is dead while she lives. You know, Paul is interesting. Paul doesn't mince his words, does he? He, like, he is a very direct apostle. The widow who lives in excessive luxury is dead while she lives. And again, this is a word, tenesco, and it does literally mean dead. Sometimes we look at those words and think, oh, is this a metaphor, is it symbolic? No, this word is the word we use for someone who is dead when life ceases to be a part of them. It's the word we use for Jesus when he's on the cross. It's the word we use for Lazarus when he's in the tomb. It's the same word that we use for Jairus' daughter. It means dead, literally the widow who lives in excessive wealth, is dead while she lives. See, Jesus sees wealth as something to be used in his service, doesn't he? Jesus talks about money almost more than anything else he talks about while he's on earth. So that must mean that it plays a pretty prominent role. Like Jesus knows that we're gonna struggle with this a bit. You know, your wealth isn't really the problem. It's what you do with your wealth that becomes the problem. Jesus tells this parable uh, called the parable of the talents. And he tells about this master who goes off on a long trip and he leaves his wealth behind to, uh, for his servants to take care of. They're gonna invest it, they're gonna use it, they're gonna grow it. And when the, the master comes back from his trip and he sees the servants, he rewards the ones who took the talent that he gave them, the money he gave them, and invested it and grew it. But the one that didn't grow it, the one that he just buried it and didn't do anything with it, he had really harsh words for that, that one. Right after he tells that parable, Jesus talks about separating, separating the sheep and the goats. That, he goes right into it. And what's the criteria of separating the sheep and the goats? He says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. The criteria for separating the sheep and the goats is completely and totally taking care of those who are less fortunate than you. Your wealth isn't a problem, folks. What you do with your wealth is. And if you choose to live in, uh, what's the word? Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. If you choose to live in extravagant richness, an extravagant lifestyle, and you keep all of that for yourself, yeah, that's a problem. You have no need for the church. And... Unfortunately, you're not answering the call of Christ on your life. It's sort of like you didn't really exist. It's kind of like you're not even here. You're dead. We are called to take what's been given to us and use it on behalf of the call of Christ for those around us. 
not to hoard it for ourselves. Does that mean that you can't have a, a nice car? No, I'm not saying you can't have a nice car. I'm saying that if you're willing to spend the money on yourself to have a nice car, please be willing to step up and care for those whose needs come your way. We need to be willing to use what's been given to us on behalf of those around us. If we make this life solely about the pursuit of luxury and pleasure, we will find it a slippery slope that demands our life not give it. We'll find it to be a slippery slope that demands our life rather than give it. If we take what we've been blessed with and we use it to care for the least of these, we may actually find the very life that God offers us. This is at the heart of Christianity. This is at the heart of Jesus' message. Our whole sermon is not about this today, but I need to drive this point home for you. I need you to walk away hearing it, having it written on your heart and understanding that what you've been given is not meant for you to have all by yourself and keep. It's not meant for you to collect everything you can. You are meant to use it on behalf of those around you who are in need. <clears throat> let's, keep, uh, let's keep reading. Verses 9 and 10. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her good deeds such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. I don't have a lot to say on these two verses. We can really sum this up pretty quickly uh, just by saying that Paul is instructing Timothy to take particular care of widows who currently have nothing, but when they did have means, they used it to care for the people around them. They used it for good works. They, they gave it away. They cared for the needs that came across their front door. He's saying, look, take particular care of those folks because their heart has been in the right place. They have nothing now, and that's because they've used it in the right way, okay? Uh, verses 11 to 15. As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list. For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying things they ought not to. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. Okay. Uh, one of the things that was common in the first century here was that widows whom the, the church took care of would then, in turn, take care of those who were sick and disabled. Those who were sick and disabled would often find their way to the church. And so uh, you can think of, like, monasteries that might have whole room, like they would be the hospital, the local hospital, right? And so someone who was very sick would find their way to the church, and if there was a widow being cared for by the church, the, the, the church was caring for her basic needs, um, then the widow was going to care for those who were sick or disabled who found their way to the church. It was a, it was a trade-off. It was an exchange. You might even say that there was a, like a contract or a pledge or a vow. Okay? They might take a vow to say, look, I'm willing to stay here at the church. I'm willing to work for the church and care for the, the sick and the needy. The church is going to meet my needs. Paul shares with Timothy that he observes that when you take a young widow into the church's employ in this way, over time they become dissatisfied and they desire to live their life. They're young. And they look around and they think, I've made this vow to stay here at the church and to care for the sick and the needy, but I'm looking around and thinking, look, I, I kind of want to have a family and I kind of want to get married and I have all of these, I want to live life. And so one scholar sort of gives us this picture of an ox that has a yoke on it and the ox wants to shake off the yoke to run free in the field. In Paul's experience, when these young widows become dissatisfied with their pledge to the church, they begin to gossip. They begin to become busybodies. And if you have a bunch of folks who represent the church and they are gossiping and they're being busybodies, they're becoming idle, maybe not doing their job like they should be doing it, um, it gives an opportunity for those who are against the church to speak ill of the church, to slander it. All right, so he's saying, look, in my experience, 
don't put young widows into this sort of situation. Rather, encourage these young widows to get married. Go find a husband. Because rather than the church taking care of their needs, then the husband can take care of their needs. Rather than them being idle, they'll have families and children, and they're going to be so busy that they don't have time to gossip and do these other things. Now, that's what that means in historical context. I don't want you to think, though, that just because it means that, we should take from the passage that all young women should be managing a household or be a stay-at-home mom, or if there is a young widow, they should definitely get married. We're not saying that, okay? That is true when Paul wrote the letter to a place called Ephesus about a group of people that he knew very well. That was his recommendation to Timothy. What we can extrapolate is the importance here of staying away from idleness, gossip, and slander. We can extrapolate that those who represent the church and engage in these things, they open the church up to be slandered by the people who don't like the church. Does that make sense? That's what we can extrapolate from this. Is it true that if you're a mom that you're going to be busy? (laughs) It's Mother's Day. I'm pretty sure that we can say that's absolutely true, right? We had a funny video that even showed us just how busy they are. That is true. We do want to stay away from idleness because in idleness, that is where we often find ourselves falling away to temptation. That is where we often find ourselves having the time to do things like gossip or become busybodies going from place to place and person to person, spreading things around. We do want to stay away from that. But that doesn't mean the right way to do it is to tell every young person to get married, okay? In that day and age, in that culture, yes. Today, it's a little bit of a different world. Let's read um, verse 16. If any woman who is a believer has widows in her family, she should help them and not let the church be burdened with them so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. So this is just a really simple matter of considering all the resources that the church has, that a community has, that a group of people pulling their resources together has. Imagine the widow who lives in extravagance and luxury. Imagine if she would take her resources and care for other widows, especially if they were in her own family, but imagine if she did that for those who were in the church that she's connected to. By doing that, it would actually free the church's resources to care for others as well. Does that make sense? We're just expanding the resources here. In a very modern sense, it'd be like this. Our church has a deacon's fund. I, think, I hope you're all aware of that. Our deacon's fund is used to help folks within our church and outside of our church who have immediate needs. It, it could be simple things like, I need help getting groceries. It could be an unexpected bill that comes up. It, it might be something with the house that needs fixed, and there's no way to do that without resources. But truth be told, our deacon's fund is not a very big fund. Usually, we have maybe 1500 bucks in it. And so it's, and you know, 1500 bucks doesn't go that far sometimes. So as soon as we tap on the deacon's fund, the deacon's fund needs some time to recover from it. The way that it recovers from it is that people give to it. They put some cash in the box in the back, and that cash goes into the deacon's fund automatically. But that takes time to recover. And if we have emptied out the deacon's fund and somebody comes to us with a need, we have to say, I'm sorry, we don't have the ability to meet that need right now. So if there was somebody who, was, who had means in the church that was aware of a need, and they met it with their own resources, it frees the church then to use their resources to meet other needs. Now, I have a list. Uh, Hopefully, we can get it on the screen this morning. This requires some things. First, it requires that people give to the church. That's just a simple thing, okay? If you're going to have a deacon's fund, if you're going to have that sort of money, that pooled resources, it requires that people give to it. It also requires that people trust the church to be a good steward. And I think that's tricky. Because I've been around ministry and nonprofit world long enough to know that it's very easy to break people's trust. It's very easy for folks to say, I used to give to that, but I don't want to give to that anymore because I don't trust what they're going to do with that money. So it requires people give, but it requires that the church acts in good faith on what people give to it. It requires that they build trust. Remember, trust is something that takes a long time to build, but it breaks like that. It also requires that people are involved enough to be aware of each other's needs. A person can't step up and meet a need in our congregation if they're not aware of the needs in our congregation. So 
Does it make sense for us to publicize a huge list of everybody's needs? No, that would, that would be embarrassing for a lot of folks. What it does make sense is that we are in relationship with one another, close enough relationship with one another that we feel comfortable saying, I got a really unexpected, uh, I had a water pipe break at my house, super unexpected. I don't know how I'm gonna make, it's outside my normal budget. I'm gonna need some help. We need to be able to be comfortable enough with each other, in relationship enough with each other to be aware of each other's needs. And then the last thing is this. You know, when I was growing up, what we would preach, the message we would preach about money was that if you're a follower of Jesus, it's not your money anyway. That's God's money. It's God's money to do what he wants with, right? And that's a good message. But I found that a lot of people struggle to hear that. And I feel like a lot of people push back against that. So let me say it this way. This requires that people freely give from that which is rightfully theirs to the people around them. You have a job. You earn a paycheck. Rightfully, that is your paycheck. Whether you believe that's God's money or not, put that aside. That's that's your paycheck. Having a deacon's fund or having the ability to help those who are in need requires that you freely give from that which is rightfully yours. It requires that you make a sacrifice. And there's no two ways to get around that. That is what giving to the church is. It's a sacrifice. You could maybe afford something that you've been wanting a very long time. But instead of that, we make the sacrifice and we give to the church. We freely give from something that is rightfully ours. That's the way that I look at it. This is a free gift. Do you know how how great the free gift is that God gave me? On that cross, God took everything I have ever done, everything I've ever thought, everything I've ever said upon himself, and he didn't charge me a thing. In fact, he took it upon himself and he gave me a great gift, and that is life with him. It is a whole new way of looking at the world around me. The gift that God has freely given me from something that was rightfully his, is so incredible and so great. The best thing I can think of to do is try and mirror that in my life to the world around me, to freely give from that which is rightfully mine, to bless the world around me. Make sense? Let's keep reading. Verses 17 to 20. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scriptures say, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading on the grain, treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that the others may take warning. Okay. So the key to this passage where Paul's talking about elders that are worth double honor is that there are elders in the Ephesian church who are doing the job of overseer and also the job of preaching and teaching and other things. There are folks who are in leadership that are doing many things. And Paul's saying, look, you need to take care of those people. So imagine, if you would, a modern day church and if there was an overseer or an elder or somebody on the church board that did the job that they were assigned in that place but beyond that, did a million other things for the community. Imagine that there's a person like that. That person should be well cared for. They should be honored. Here's a good example. Let's say that if you had a guest speaker coming to church, you would give them a stipend for the morning. You'd give them a a thank you check of money. But then if you ask somebody that's an elder or an overseer to get up and give you a word, Uh, to preach on a Sunday morning because, say, your pastor's sick, or maybe you're between pastors. You're working on hiring a new pastor. You should give that person a stipend as well because they're doing the work. They're doing twice the work. They're doing what they're called to do. They're doing what they signed up to do, and they're doing far beyond that as well. And so we need to take care of the folks who take care of the church. That's what this is saying. There are people in the church who are stepping up beyond measure, and we need to take care of those folks. If we take care of them, they take care of the church. They're not serving in anticipation of a gift. They're serving out of love for the church and love for you. They're serving from within this circle. Love of God and love of others. That is why they're, ser- they're serving. If they were serving for a gift, they would be somewhere out here. 
That's not why they're serving. You can tell the people that are serving from within the circle and those who are serving because they want the acclaim. They want the thank you. They want the gift. We need to make sure that we are taking care of the folks who are taking care of the church. Now, there's this other part of this passage, and I have a whole bunch of stuff written here, but I don't like any of it. Paul talks about, like, an accusation. He says, look, if an elder or an overseer is accused about something, then don't do anything about it unless you have two or three witnesses. But those who sin publicly, uh, make them, you know, rebuke them publicly, that others may take warning. You know, this was written 2,000 years ago. Um, We live in a very different world today. Depending on the accusation, there is no way we should be waiting for two or three people to come forward, okay? We live in a world where if there's an accusation that has to do with children, hands down, we do something about it right then and there. And so I don't want you to feel like this is saying that we shouldn't do that. By law, we must do something about that. And by law, if we don't, we could also be um, prosecuted persecuted. Um, I've been involved in a number of church disciplinary sort of things, so it really depends on the accusation here. If the accusation is not some form of abuse, then, then it's possible that you wait till you have a couple people that are able to come forward. But it, here's the thing. A, a church leader's reputation is a tender thing. Any leader's reputation. Think about a school teacher or a business owner. Everyone's reputation is a tender thing. If someone accuses you of something that is wrong, of wrongdoing, of sinful behavior of some kind, we don't want to immediately just assume that the accusation is right. We need to be cautious and careful so that we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. At the same time, we have to care for both the person who's accused and the person who is the accuser, all right? And that's the sort of thing that we have to flesh out every single time that something happens. Now, most of you guys know that I used to run a summer camp and a retreat center. And I would tell my summer camp counselors every single year that if there was an accusation made against them, if they, are, if they speak the truth, if they say that they're innocent, they've got someone in their corner. But I'm still gonna remove them from leadership immediately because that's the caring thing to do for everyone involved including the person who's making the accusation. If the person's making the accusation, it's not gonna do them any good to see that person still in authority over them because they obviously believe that they have been wronged. So I'm gonna do my best to love. I'm gonna do my best to lift up the person who is reporting to me, but I am also gonna remove them from the situation immediately. That is the right thing to do. Again, That's something we have to figure out every single time something like this comes up. And I've been in situations where people have said, no, this is not true. And I've been in situations where people have said, yep, it is absolutely true. And then we have to take a whole different course of action. Church discipline, (laughs) it's not fun. I don't know anybody that I think is like, oh, this is some good stuff. I love this. This is hard stuff. But accountability is an important part of the discipline that, that is the Christian life. We must hold each other accountable. And I just think back over the last 10 years about the number of Christian leaders, like very famous Christian leaders that you've heard of who have fallen away, who have made poor choices. I can think of some who have used their power to coerce people that work for them in a sexual manner. I can think of people who use their power and they they abuse the people who work for them. We must take these things with seriousness. We must hold our leaders accountable, myself included. If you were to hear that I was doing anything like that, I hope that you would do something about it. I hope you would come to me. I hope you would talk to Scott Boy or any other person who's on our church board. I need accountability, just like every other leader out there needs accountability, okay? Now, Paul also says that if there is a public sin, then it needs to be rebuked publicly. Now. There's a a guy named Matthew Henry. He says it this way, and I really like it. He says, those that sin before all rebuke before all that the plaster may be as wide as the wound. So think about it this way. If I cut off my arm, it does no good for me to put a Band-Aid on that, does it? I need something quite a bit more to cover that wound, yes? When somebody who is in a position like an overseer or a a preacher or something like that and they do something publicly that injures or hurts people around them, then the rebuke, the discipline, should be as wide as the wound is. 
which means that there should be some publicity to that. That might mean that person needs to get up and make an apology. Uh, or, or here's an example, this might be helpful, a kind of a real world one. What happens if a pastor embezzles money from the church? Well, that's a very real thing, right? It's probably happened before. Maybe you've been a part of a church where that has happened. What happens if a pastor embezzles money from the church? If the church board just privately rebukes him, what good does that do? Does the church board still trust him or her? Probably not. Does the church trust that person still? Probably not. Does the congregation feel like justice has been accomplished? Probably not. No. What should happen is that that pastor should be fired. That doesn't mean that there can't be forgiveness. That doesn't mean that there can't be some sort of reconciliation. But that pastor should be fired. That firing is the public rebuke. That firing is the way that you move forward as a congregation. That firing is the plaster that covers the wideness of the wound. It's also the warning to any other pastors on staff that that is inappropriate and unacceptable behavior that will not be tolerated, which is what Paul is getting at. Does that make sense? This is not about trying to be harsh with punishment. This is meant to communicate how serious we should take leadership. If we can't take church leadership, whether you are the leader or I'm the leader, if we can't take it seriously enough to say, I know that taking money from the church is wrong or whatever the thing might be, then we should not be in leadership. And if the oversight, let's say it's the church board in our case, if they are not willing to have the hard conversation or make the hard call to say, you can no longer be a leader, then they should also not be in leadership. Leadership is a serious thing. It's not meant to be harsh, it's meant to be serious. Because when we don't act in accordance with what we're called to act like, we open up the church to slander and gossip and all sorts of things. It is not good for the local newspaper to talk about the local pastor who embezzled money and is now going to jail and has to make restitution and now the church is out. That's not helping God's message be spread at all. Rather, Paul says, we had that stuff off before it ever happens. And we're gonna get into that in our next section here. So let's read verses 21 to 25 as we come to a close. I charge you in the sight of God in Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. The sins of some men are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not cannot be hidden. So we really get the sense here that we're reading a letter, don't we? Can you imagine that Paul, when he was writing this letter to Timothy 2,000 years ago, thought that 2,000 years from that date, churches would be reading about his home remedies for stomach illnesses? Like, we get the sense that this is a very real letter from one person to another, um, He says, don't be hasty in the laying on of hands. And I think that can be a really confusing phrase because the first thing we go to is either prayer or healing. That's why we lay hands on folks, right? In prayer and healing. So why would Paul be saying, um, you know, withhold healing? (laughs) He's not saying that. Um, There's two options that this could be. Either one of them makes sense and I'm comfortable with both of them, which is why I'll share both of them with you. This is either the laying on of hands in the ordination of a leader, or it's the acceptance of a fallen leader back into leadership. That's what we're talking about here. And that makes a whole lot more sense when you consider the passages that have led up to it. Paul's saying, take it slow. Leadership is serious. It's nothing to be trifled with. Don't rush into it. Don't be careless with your laying on of hands and lifting up a new leader. Don't be, don't be quick just to bring somebody back because they said that they were sorry for embezzling the money from the church. Don't be too hasty lest their repentance be false. Take it slow. And Timothy, and Paul warns Timothy not to share in the sins of others. You know, there is some culpability, some guilt, some repentance that is needed for by the pastor who brings in the embezzler. Because let's say that I have the opportunity someday to bring on an associate pastor. 
And I bring that person on and I say, look, this person, is a, it's, they're great. I, we've vetted them. We've, we've talked to them. I know them. I feel good with them. I trust them. You should trust them. And then they break all of our trust. Not only does that person need to be out of leadership, but I also need to come to you and say, I am sorry because I made a mistake. I'm sorry because I thought that that was a, that was a good fit for us. I thought that they were trustworthy, and it turns out that they weren't. Every good leader needs to learn the words, I'm sorry I made a mistake. Every good leader needs to learn the words, I'm sorry I made a mistake. It requires humility, but it is very, very important to leadership. If a leader can't say that, then they, again, they should not be a leader. And, and Paul's just warning Timothy, look, don't take part in the sins of others. Take it slow when you're bringing someone into leadership because you're responsible for them. You're responsible for their actions to a certain extent. Again, you know, if, if Timothy brought on, I don't know, Jacob and Jacob ends up embezzling the funds, Timothy didn't embezzle the funds. We're not saying that. We're just saying Timothy brought Jacob in. And so we need to be slow about bringing somebody in. We need to be slow about bringing the next person in. We need to be slow about having Jacob return to a leadership position. We need to be slow about trusting them. We trust them with a little. We trust them with a little. We trust them with a little until they're back in. So that's chapter five, folks. Kind of a doozy. It's, um, it's not like the, the, the most fun one for me to preach. It may not be the most fun one for you to hear. Uh, but this is, this is why we walk through scripture like this. This is why we take a book and we say, we're gonna walk right through it. Because if I was picking sermons based on what is fun for me to preach, we wouldn't get here, and you wouldn't hear the importance of the sort of accountability and discipline that needs to be had in church leadership, which is why we do it this way. So I'm gonna give you five, five takeaways because I feel like we covered a lot of ground today, so here are your five takeaways. Number one, rebuke gently. This is a good thing not just for church leaders to know about others, this is good for you to know about your communication with each other. Rebuke gently. There is nobody in this place who you have the authority to rebuke, rebuke, right? Not the old, not the ones in leadership, not the young, that's not what it's for. Don't shy away from rebuking, but don't overdo it. Um, widow care is number two. We have to know that that is part of our call as a church family is to care for those who are widows. And it's not just widows, folks. I mean, widows is the word that we use in this passage, but if we look at the entire New Testament, it is also, it's orphans, it's the poor, it's the disabled, it's the disenfranchised, it's all of these folks that fit into this category. That is our role, okay? But here's the other thing, and I'm gonna say, I wanna say this really clear. If there is somebody in your family who is a widow that does not have the means to take care of themselves, it is your job first and foremost to step up. If, there is some, if you have a grandma in your life who no longer has a husband or a kid living at home and they need their grass mowed, you get over and mow the grass. That's your job. You're the first line of defense. And if there's nobody in that widow's life to mow the grass, one of us better be doing it, okay? Number three, let's stay away from idleness. Idleness is, the, it's just like, is the slippery slope to leading us to fall into temptation. And in this passage, we're talking about young widows who are idle and they're falling into gossip and slander and all kinds of stuff, but guess what? That's not just young widows, that is every single one of us. We wanna stay away from idleness, okay? Uh, number four, that double honor. Remember the folks who are doing 13 million jobs in the church and let's take care of them because they're doing it out of this place. And so we need to care for them out of this place. And number five, don't rush into leadership. Whether that's you wanting to become a leader, let's not rush into it. Or it's you who are a leader now, considering who to, who to bring into leadership, don't rush it, take it slow, take your time, get to know them, make sure they're the right fit. I hope that all of this is helpful to you. I, again, I realize it's not always the most fun to do it this way, but it's good stuff. It's stuff that we need to know. It's helpful for us to understand what does it look like for us to live as a family? Well, this is a big part of it. I hope that you're able to listen to these uh, messages and not just remember facts, but also be thinking about how do I apply this here and now? How does this affect my life? How does this affect my church life? Because that is really the point of it, okay? Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website kanoichurch.org. 
sure I'm glad we're in this together. <laughs>